Welcome to the Next Level Casino Careers Show, a series highlighting industry tips and insights from the best minds in the casino and hospitality industry. Enjoy the show. Luke Palladino, how are you doing? Good morning, Kyle. I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, Luke, uh, just to start, I want to just take a second to thank you for joining us today. Uh, you wear a lot of hats and have worn a lot of hats over your career from celebrity chef to executive chef to strategic advisor to opening up restaurants to owning your own restaurants. So, you know, this is still we're really early in this podcast, um, only about 10 episodes in. So to have your culinary mind, your expertise in the restaurant business and hospitality in general, um, I think people are going to find a lot of value today. So once again, just thank you for joining the show. Thank you. I hope to add value to everyone, everyone's experience. And it's great to, to have you here. I'm, I'm here in, uh, in Highlands along with you. Beautiful day. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, we'll heat up later, but as of now, it's, it's a relatively nice outside. So Luke, you know, we usually start with the origin story, but before we jump into that, because I know it's hard to do when you've had such an you know, amazing career that you've had, where did your passion for cooking and the restaurant business, if you had to like go back to when you were a child, where did it all start, that passion? That far, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it, it started, I would say, I, I grew up in a, an Italian family, born in New York, and I grew up in New York and Florida, and, and then in my high school years, New Jersey. So I was always surrounded by family at, at, at holidays, and, and there was just endless, just amazing, delicious Italian food. So I think I really learned what that is, that familial feeling and sense of community around the table and the importance of food, how it really brought people together. And I enjoyed those times and, and revere them very much uh, in, my, in my memory banks here. I, I started my, so I was interested, I was 13 years old and I had to go to work to, to earn. I wanted, back then Nikes were popular, they first came out and I wanted a surfboard. I was in Florida at this point. So I, I went out and I got a job as a dishwasher and I was washing pots and pans. It wasn't glorious. I was cleaning bushels of spinach back before they were pre-washed and clean like we see them today. There were bushels caked with dirt. Uh, I liked the kitchen atmosphere. It was different. I felt different. I fit in. I, I felt like we were a group of pirates and we kind of did things our own way. And it was cool. And I felt cool to be surrounded by uh, this environment. So um, I cooked all through high school and it was just really what I wasn't really much of an academic then in school. And I wanted, I figured I might as well be a chef. So from there, I went to the Culinary Institute of America up in Hyde Park, New York, and I loved it. I loved every moment of it. Two years of schooling there. And then from there, I went to work in New Orleans and Boston and San Francisco around the States. And then when I was working in Boston, I realized that it was really hot in the early 90s, Italian food, that there was much more to Italian food than what was being presented in American restaurants. And it was really becoming a known cuisine and out there. So I decided to go and, and learn my craft in Italy. I had no idea what I was doing or what to do or where to go. But I talked to some people, saved some money and set out with a backpack and my knives to do stages. And stages are where you work for free for the experience. And that's what I did. So I went to Italy and had no plan, went to Rome, knocked on some doors, ate, ate in many restaurants. And then they gave me an opportunity to cook and I cooked for free uh, in about 22 different restaurants around the boot over about five, six years. Wow. And then wait, well, yeah, let's actually stay there for a moment because that's fascinating, right? The, the total immersion um, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you kind of knew at a relatively young age, high school, that this was a career for you. Um, you know, you, you kind of started your craft and then recognized the opportunity within America. So then you went to Italy. I mean, it was like that decision process. Take us back to that. Were you, were you just kind of dead set on, no, I need to go to Italy. I, this is where I'm going to get better. Kind of talk through that decision process if you want to mind. I, I loved what I did. I was passionate about food and cooking in my career. It, it, it was really, I was really that naive. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was. I said, I have to go. I'm going to do it. 
And I remember getting on the airplane and landing and I thought, what did I just do? Here I am. I better do it. And it was honestly, it was fun. It was an adventure. And looking back, it's, it's, it, it is a great story, seemingly. And I, I enjoy and revere the experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. However, during doing it, it was a little terrifying. Back then, I speak Italian now, but back then, I was, my time was really poor. I, it was in a foreign country for the first time ever, first time I flew overseas. I remember getting on the plane in GFK. They were de-icing the wings, and I was, I was, <laughs> I was terrified. And I, I got there, and I didn't know people, and I was on my own. And I, I, my first flat apartment they gave me had no electricity. I had candles and a cot in an enormous old Roman, uh, enormous big apartment. I had uh, a tub with just cold water and no shower head. And I would shower at night without water and shave with cold water, ice cold water. But that was probably the worst of my experiences. Other, other than that, I had pretty comfortable beds and warm water from there. So I think one of the key things was, is that there, I, what I did was I was eager and I traveled and I knocked on doors. And then I struck up a, a relationship with Carla Petrini, who started the president of Sol, uh, Slow Food. And that's the preservation of food and, and culture throughout the world. It's, it's grown into a worldwide organization. And from there, I worked with his, their restaurants. And then he made calls for me. I'd go to different regions. I'd tell them where I wanted to go learn the cuisine. He'd call friends. And then other chefs I worked with or restaurateurs would call their friends and say, hey, Luke, this, there's an American kid coming and he has good hands. He's a hard worker. And then from there, I developed all these relationships and lifelong friendships. And I was fortunate to meet many great restaurateurs, work throughout all the regions, and also taste meat winemakers and, and taste all of the wonderful Italian wines. Luke, I imagine, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine when you were going door to door and you were building those relationships, I imagine you got a lot of no's. I'm curious to know, because this is all about you know helping people in their careers do you, if you want to succeed in the culinary space, do you have to have thick skin? And was that kind of those reps um, at such a young age and then that foundation built um, from that? I'm just curious to know, as we think about, you know, the necessary qualities to be, you know, a good chef, is, is that one of them? Well, I think any career that you want to pursue and you're passionate about, it's you're going to meet rejection. And you'll get no's, you'll get people that don't understand. It might not be the right place of the relationship. And you have to persevere. You have to just press on. And from whatever that situation is, just make sure you learn from it and grow and figure it out. And if you don't have the experience to work in a place or whatever position it might be, find somehow to, to gain that experience so you can grow. I love that. And, and Luke, um, just quickly on the same point, that total immersion experience of going to Italy and traveling to tons of different restaurants to really owning your craft within that space to be excellent at, um, in the culinary space, whether it's Mexican food, bar and grill, does there have to be some kind of level of total immersion to really craft that menu or that recipe now understood not everyone can travel and, and dump themselves into that area, but like, how does one simulate that or is that necessary? I'm just curious to know your thoughts there. So I would say this is that one is back then when I was up and coming in my career, we didn't have the Internet and recipes and ideas and techniques weren't shared other than what we learned classically in school. So if you read Bon Appetit or Gourmet or Food Arts, you would see what other chefs are doing and they wouldn't share their secrets normally. And so what we had to do is you had to go work for the great chefs. You had to go work for the right people to understand stylistically who they were, how they approached food, what their experiences were, what they brought literally to the table. So I would say that's the most important thing is to work for great people. Don't chase money. And when I left school, there were certain people that wanted careers that were more corporate. And that's fine if that's your goal do that. But I wanted to be a chef firstly, and I wanted to understand food and respect Italian cuisine and go and see it firsthand for myself and learn there, right there, uh, you know, in, in that country. But I would say otherwise is always work for great people, find out who they are, you know, find good mentors, whether you know them or not. And that's how you learn. 
So Luke, from there, you know, you spend time in Italy. Kind of take us now to where does your career arc go uh, back to the United States? Yeah, so I came back from Italy and I was approached by uh, Steve Wynn to help out with, it was back when he was opening the Bellagio and I came and I met him and uh, had a whirlwind tour uh, and I ended up doing Concept at the Mirage. So I, I built my, it was my first time in the casino industry and I had no idea what it was or how to, I didn't understand it. And it was a complete departure from brick and mortar restaurants. And I found it fascinating and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I worked around the States. I was in Aspen. Then I went to Atlantic City, opened some restaurants at the Borgata and at Harris and what was Revel then and Caesars and in Philadelphia as well. I consulted for other casino companies. And so as I was building my restaurants and my team and my and the culture, um, I developed this, this skill set because I, I understood leases and real estate, how to build menus and train staff and wine programs and beverage. So in 2016, I, I decided to, it, it was another chapter in my life, and I started Meta Hospitality, which is my development solutions company. We do food and beverage development for casinos and hotels and resorts, uh, from brand ideation to development to construction, design, building, recipes, management, oversight, it, So the whole gamut. It's a lot of fun, and it's very interesting. Luke, never a dull um, moment. I want to come back to something you said there, complete departure from brick and mortar. So that transition from that, that kind of space versus working so closely for many years in the casino and hospitality space, specifically casino resorts. What are some of those main differences that you learned over the years that you need to consider trying to give value back to those listening? If you're working in the casino space and you're in charge of a restaurant or you work within a restaurant, what are some core differences maybe you need to have top of mind? Well, I would say that the the, the benefit is if you're in a brick and mortar restaurant, your location's extremely important. Not that it's not in a casino, but it's more, much more important there. It can make or break you. It, which way your door faces? Is, it, is the traffic oncoming? Can they see your door? How do they get there? Can you predict how many covers you'll do per night? That's very hard to do in a brick and mortar. And, and most people don't know, restaurateurs, young chefs like I did, would take spaces because you, you thought you got a good, you might've had a good deal and you were passionate about operating it. The, the benefit of a casino is that you have a, a captive audience and that there's shows and there's entertainment and you know that you'll do X number covers per night to support your business. So that's, a beautiful thing really at the core and the base of it all that's a great way to start is is to have that captive audience there built in and also just different clientele i think you get more uh, people from different areas international um, varying experiences and in, in casino restaurants there's variations between you in, in house in one building you have buffets and quick serves food court food halls now uh, like we're working on at yamava and steakhouses, you could an Asian restaurant, Italian, and, and so on. Captive audience. That, that, that's so a simple thing to say, but I, you're a hundred percent right. And hungry, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, the exactly. excitement of, of their gaming experience on top of maybe they've been here an hour or two. Um, you know, that they're you know, one thing that I think I'm paraphrasing here, but our GM always says, you know, you can win over someone's attitude and experience through their stomach. Um and man, does that go a long way. So pivoting there, this is a broad question, so take it wherever you want. But if, if we're looking at the keys to an excellent dining experience, and maybe they're simple, but what are some of the keys that are going to give you a consistent, great dining experience that not only are going to want return customers, but word of mouth and you know, great momentum in that aspect? Kyle, I think it's just the basics. It's friendly, personalized service, great food a comfortable atmosphere that the, it, and all these are small nuances too that people don't think about that go into restaurant. What's the temperature level? Is it comfortable? The music level stylistically, what's the music? So these are things that really go into what we do in restaurants so that we create the right kind of atmosphere and also warmth. Warmth is how you're treated by the staff. What are the lighting levels? Lighting is very important 
again, the ambiance. How does it make you feel while you're in that restaurant? That's really important. And that's one of the key things to setting up any restaurant is, is all these factors here that really, it's a sweet spot. It's very hard to do. And when you do it, it's, it's, it can be very successful for you. I think even also, it's, it's just from the seating process to ordering and, and payment, even those basics as well, just ease and flow of those uh, as, as well, just for a, a solid customer experience. Luke, I think you hit on something really important. You know, you mentioned temperature, level of music, warmth, but you also said it's very hard to do. What I'm getting from that is a consistent experience, is knowing your experience and delivering kind of that promise every single time. And you said that's very hard to do. What makes it difficult and why do a lot of operators and people who work within restaurants kind of fail to meet that consistency? Well, I think it, I, the key thing there for me is unless you're the owner operator and you're in the restaurant every single day, it, that was, that's just very uncommon these days. If you're a small, if you're a, an aspiring chef, you might start off with one restaurant and then all of a sudden you're expanding three, four, five, a casino restaurant maybe, and, or you're trusting a team to develop and manage concepts for you or for a hotel, whoever you might work for. It's a matter of having the, uh, I call it the eyes of the owner and understanding what that is. So it's really being in tune to these and having awareness of all these factors because they can quickly change. And if you don't notice them and you're not constantly managing them, things, the light levels will be up, the music will be wrong, it'll be too loud, it'll be cold or warm in the room, the flowers aren't fresh, whatever it might be, the lighting levels are, are too high or off. So. All I these things. That. The eyes of the owner. So Luke, I know you've worked and led several different teams. Kind of how do you empower a team to kind of have that mindset, right? Whether you're a busser or you're a cook or you're a manager, kind of how, is there any tips you can provide to kind of help teams get that eyes of the owner? Yeah, I think that the key thing is to, people need to feel like that they're involved, that their voices matter. And I always say no involvement, no commitment. And they need to feel safe to be heard. Their opinions, when you talk, usually pre-shift is communication or during, during the day in operations. Uh, but pre-shift is a great time. And what we always coach people to do is to speak their minds, let us know what the feedback is, customer feedback. How is the relationship with the kitchen? How do people feel about the dishes? And I always say, if if there's anything that you're not confident in selling on this menu, on any menu, we need to know because it's the onus is on us to fix it. And you should feel comfortable to go and speak to your chef or to any manager and state this. This is what the customer feedback is or this is how I feel. I don't feel comfortable selling this because whatever reason it is. So open, open communication, honesty. They need to feel involved that their voice matters. And that's how you build trust. And I think another way to build trust is really genuinely looking after your staff and caring for them and treating them as human beings. I, I love those points. And, I, you know, you're the expert, but I think of me as the consumer. And when I go to a restaurant, a lot of times my wife and I suffer from, even if it's a small menu, from decision fatigue. And, you know, I kind of <laughs> narrow it down to these three or four things, but I don't know, right? Uh, I need help. So you'll ask the waiter or waitress. And man, if, if to, to your point earlier, if they can't explain it or at least kind of tell you and have that engagement, that's a, an extreme knock, at least in my opinion, on that service or on that restaurant. So yes, I think that's a really it, great tip. It, how many times you've been in a restaurant when they say, don't order the veal dish or, or they'll or warn you dishes not to have? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a red flag. Yeah, that is a red flag. So, so I love that. I think that's something that people could take is... And connecting with their staff and giving them that empowerment to say, you know, if you're not confident, let's talk about it. And why is that? Yeah. Um, so once again, another broad question, Luke, so maybe we'll narrow it down to three things, but when you're creating a restaurant concept, what are the most important considerations to set yourself up for success? Well, understanding 
your market, who, who is your customer? I think many, and I did this myself, I was a passionate chef and it was all about me and what I wanted to cook and I wanted to take Italian food to people and the public in general. Uh, I did very well, I lucked out, um, but most of us are really blind as we start. I, I would say key, even in the, especially in the casino hotel market in any restaurant market now these days, because there is so much competition out there people know more about food and service. And, and, and if it's not a cohesive, well put together concept that makes you feel good and the, and the service and food are consistent, you, you won't go because we have too many choices, much too many, many, too many choices now. So I would say understanding who your market is, that is key. And if you don't know, find out, look at the, de there's information out there, the demographic, do focus groups, ask questions, Look at who's, if you're looking at a, at a competitor, whether it's in the casino market or in the private sector, understand your neighborhood, who's doing things well, who's doing things less well, talk to other restaurateurs, talk to other casinos, make friends within the industry because people, they'll, they'll share information. There's nuggets of wisdom everyone has. So ask a lot of questions, be curious, don't ever assume. And that's how you strategize. I'd say also, not only that, make you know what is the size of your menu, what's the pricing, what will the what will get, what are guests willing to pay, how many seats do I have, what's the real estate, the the lease deal, the terms, all these things really play into it. Can I pay the rent? What are the utilities here? If you're not sure what they are, figure if you need to. These are things you need to know. Again, this is more private sector, uh, and you know from there, what's your marketing plan? Marketing, social media are, are enormously important today, and they're hard for small restaurateurs to to, uh, to afford. So really work on that. And if you're a small restaurateur, you'll 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 be wearing many different hats because you can't afford to pay a public relations or marketing team. But if you're in a casino or hotel, you just utilize and leverage work with your your public relations and marketing team they're only as good as the information you give them and you have to share ideas you can't expect them to create everything for you because they don't understand fully who you are your business model your vision they should and as it's a it's it's a relationship that's developed over time and you get to know each other but you have to work arm in arm with them to really build your platforms yeah, absolutely. And that's something beyond the marketing side I've learned over the years is that exact point, which is you got to let them in. And back to your earlier point, kind of that ownership, that's a big part of it too. Because it's interesting, right? So because you could be a business owner at a small brick and mortar restaurant and you don't have the resources, right? You don't have the PR, the big marketing budget, some of these things. But one of the advantages you might have is you know the concept in and out you know the passion behind it you kind of know the mission statement so all these things even though you don't have the resources you have an advantage in the sense that you know the product and i, I guess I, I think what i'm just trying to say is is to your point is even even though you're a bigger team and you have the resources you still need to have kind of that ownership mentality and keeping it simple that way everyone's aligned and when you go to market everyone kind of understands the position and the experience if that makes sense Yes, it does. And yes, exactly. You just can't rely. You can't say, oh, I have this PR marketing team. Bring me on the, all these ideas and do everything for me. It's very competitive out there. And I would say back to social media, if it's a very powerful tool. But if you're just posting a two or three pictures of food and a cocktail per week, that's that's relevant and it's important, but it's not enough. I, so I feel that what are we doing that's different than anyone else in the market? How do we really show off our expertise, the people behind the scenes, chefs talking about food, butchering, cutting, shots during service, plating of food, car, mixologists coming up with different crafts and shrubs and making mixes and infusions and creating this cocktail. People telling their stories as well. So really, for me, it's so much more about human connection because that's what gets people excited and want to discover your brand in your restaurant. Luke, I feel like that's the perfect segue into trends because you kind of touched on some of them. Um, you know, we're working closely with Forbes Travel Guide and trying to elevate our service standards, which is always a focus of ours. And one of the things they talk about is stories and how your customer is constantly looking to be part of the story, understand the story, right? From 
And they, they, they phrase it like this, does it make sense? The menu placement compared to the fonts they use, compared to the decor in the restaurant, to the, res the restaurant experience itself, you touched on the human connection, the story behind the chefs. I feel like there's a huge trend. It's probably always been important to us as human species stories, right? We all connect through stories. But curious to know your perspective. As you think of trends now and going forward in the hospitality restaurant industry, what are some trends that you are really paying attention to and implementing as you work with different restaurants? You know, I'd say the key thing is, is making people bringing attention to your brand and, you know, connecting with them, it, telling them stories. You can have all the best finishes in the world. You can have, you could build a $10 million restaurant and have the best finishes in China, glass and silver, which is all wonderful. However, it means absolutely nothing without human connection, without the right people, the right feeling. And when you when you tell a good story, you bring people, whether it's a farm or an ingredient or how the chef learned uh, something or the sommelier or a source, people, they they feel involved. They feel like they've learned something which is important to them. And now they're experiencing this with you, whether it's tasting this wine that's 25 years old from uh, some uh, an Italian, a revered Italian vineyard from some small family or a, a truffle or a scallop or, or something, a, a beautiful ingredient, they feel part of it. And not only they're, they're hearing the story, but they're also, they're, they're taking it in. They're, they're enjoying it. They're experiencing it through their, uh, not only through their senses, through their senses and they're really, it's really become becoming part of them. That's what makes it special. Other than that, I see, so I think stories are powerful and, and really getting people in. I, I also see that, People are also sourcing from suppliers with re that utilize regenerative practices that are really conscious about w the carbon footprint, where they're, how they process their their foods and ingredients to bring it to you in a more healthy manner. People are starting to, and also because of gas prices and shortages in supplies, restaurateurs there we're sourcing from more local than ever because it just makes sense. And by the way, sourcing locally isn't a new thing. A hundred years ago, we were doing this anyhow, because we didn't have airplanes and trucks and tr shipping everything. It was just the beginning of it. So it's not a new thing for us. Uh, but I think this, that it, because of this, it's a beautiful thing. So we're looking to local, even in Las Vegas, we have local farmers uh, here in Southern California. There's a beautiful product, beautiful ranchers, some of the best fish on the planet. The, uh, the vegetables here are just are, are top notch. So, uh, by that's that's something else I see that's really turned out to be beautiful. Uh, even in these this shortage, this seemingly that this shortage of, of products and gas prices, uh, making things difficult to obtain. Um, I think um, other things are there's better ways to understand what your customers are doing, meaning. Uh, easier to mine information through better better suited uh, customer satisfaction surveys. Uh, there's some really brilliant software out there and, and platforms that are doing it. Um, Look, there's a lot of good ones there. I wanna to touch on one that's, it's funny how what's, what, what do they say? What's old is new again. You, you kind of touched on that. Yeah. Um, but something that's always been important, right? Is what we just talked about, which is guest experience. Um, and reviews, right? So I think there's a level now of trans transparency of, hey, there's this restaurant, but if it's only got 3.5 rating or it's got a low rating, a lot of times people won't even consider it. So- No, to, you're dead. Yeah. If you have, if you have a 3.5 Yelp rating, you're, you're, you're just close the doors. Exactly. Or, or get so ready to. on that front, right? The Because- I think I think what I'm getting from this is you need to have a holistic experience from the marketing to the presentation to obviously the food quality has got to be great to the service. But looking at reviews, trying to give advice to people who work in the industry, what are some things that they could be doing to help with those reviews, to help on that guest experience? Because we've touched on this before, right? Like, I think naturally people have the tendency to want to speak up when their experience is bad versus good. So what can we do in the hospitality business to kind of help get better reviews to help that 
um, review process? Well, I'll tell you, is that the, the, the most powerful thing we can do, and it's really the beauty of restaurants, is that we have the ability to see our customer face-to-face -face in the moment. If you are selling a product and distributing it and shipping it out to someone, you have to you you have to go through the process and send it. They receive it, and then hopefully you get a good review online from someone you've never met or seen. Whereas when people come to restaurants, they're in our care. And while they're in our care is at that moment is the time to understand. We can we know and with awareness of something we practice and what we teach is that for managers, chefs, servers, front of the house staff is to read people. You can tell if someone's not having a great experience, whether they they might not be too uh, excited about something. They're looking around. They're not finishing their dish, they're not eating it with fervor like that they're enjoying it. So these are things to go and ask. People won't speak up and say, well, the, this dish wasn't really to my liking. Some people will, but many won't. And then what will happen is the expectation, everything becomes critical. So they didn't like their dish. Then they didn't get this. The server spilled water. We're not perfect. And then what happens then at the end, if you don't address it while they're in your care, it's very likely you can get a negative review. So while I teach, we teach is to, while they're in our care in the restaurant in that moment is to understand where they are in their experience. And if it's not right, change the dish, get them a new glass of bottle of wine, whatever it takes to create, to make them into raving fans instead of raging reviewers. Oh, I love that. Writing that one down. Raving fans instead of raging reviewers. Um, pivoting slightly here, um, you know, I actually looked at the reports, the hospitality and food service sector rebounded a little bit from the, from the jobs perspective, but still we're not to the levels that we were pre-pandemic. So curious to know your perspective as it relates to those who might be in the industry or thinking about joining the industry if you wouldn't mind, make the case of why someone should consider, you know, a career within culinary, hospitality, restaurants, um, and maybe speak to possibly the opportunities that are available now that maybe weren't available to Luke when you started. Well, I think the key things are it's it's a great time to be in hospitality. I believe from where I grew up in the business, it was a much different time. And now we're in a place where and we've all heard the stories. Um, over the last few years about restaurants and, and some issues and flaws that were in the industry. Not everyone operates that way. And I would say now is that there's a much higher standard. There's so many more opportunities. The wages are better. There's benefits. Uh, people aren't expected to work 14 hour shifts any longer like we did, like I did when I was growing up as a young chef. The people recognize that there's work life balance for managers, chefs, uh, all the above. I, so I think it's no better. And companies, casinos, hotels uh, are willing to train people and bring them up. And there's a lot, there's a big, quick trajectory. If you do well and you're committed and you're smart, you can grow very quickly in this industry now because it's thinned out. It's thinned out quite a bit. And so providing much opportunity for anyone who wants to consider a career in food and beverage. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked earlier about how competitive it is now, but with that competitive landscape and so many options for restaurants as a career, there's lots of options there as well. There if someone's looking at Luke, right? Luke, you've done a lot. You've, you've done it all. You've been a restaurant owner. You've been a celebrity chef. You've been an executive chef with some of the biggest casinos and brands in the globe, a strategic advisor. If someone's looking at you and man, I, I, I want to be not like Luke, but kind of on that same career path. I want to kind of own my, my own craft and be at that level as far as within the industry. What are some required skills or, or the mindset? Just take it where you want to advance to that level. I would say is the key thing is work ethic is to work hard. It's sorry, everyone. It just, it is what it is. It just takes a lot of work and passion and, study your craft, learn from people. The beauty is we have the internet now these days. So this, you can Google anything you want, any recipe, any restaurant, any bio on someone and learn different things. So do that. 
um, test things out, test your assumptions, test your recipes, test your everything that you do, your systems, your operations. I'd say be very curious. I was always curious and I'm still curious. Um, that really keeps you open minded. I think the key thing is open mindedness and curiosity really helps you grow because you allow different perspectives in as to when you might be closed and then other things can't permeate and get into your awareness. So I, I suggest that as well. Um, I would probe and analyze all decision making as well between successes, what made it successful, really what made it successful and why. Most things that are successful, people say, great, it's successful. Awesome. Also analyze and probe the failures, like what didn't work so well and why didn't it work? Was it us? Was it our state of mind? Did we miss something? What it is? And I would say, you know, practice upstream thinking in business and what you're doing uh, so that in case in case the boat starts to sink, you know, where the life jackets are before it does, as opposed to trying to find them when it's uh, later, later. Luke, what few, I, I love what you said there, fuel your curiosity. What fuels your curiosity today? You know, I would say so today at this chapter in my life, I love to help people improve their businesses and grow. Uh, I enjoy all aspects of that uh, from branding and design and um, putting it together, bringing people together, building teams. It, one thing that gives me a, a much, much satisfaction is I remember in the days when I was a novice and a newbie and inexperienced, I look to mentor. So I, I hope that I can. I, I, I look to mentor people and help them become successful and save them some time and help them grow faster because I can lend some advice to them. And that's what I, I like to do. I like to build people in their careers, give them confidence and show them the way. Um, on, on the subject of mentors, because it's an important one. Um, I'm sure you've had several throughout your career, uh, but if you had to narrow it down to a few, I'm sure there's a lot that are coming to the surface of your mind right now. But if you, if you think to your career to this point, who have been, a, a, a couple, if you wouldn't mind naming two or three mentors who have served you and the impact they've had on your career. Yeah, I would say people who've helped me grow and learn the most was one, one of um, a chef, a, a restaurateur in Venice, Italy, Cesare Benelli, was, uh, who's still at El Colo's restaurant. I was partners with him for a, a couple of years there working. He really, he showed me when I went there, it was, I think I really tasted food for the first time, understanding product, place, culture, seasonality, really treating food with a tremendous respect. Uh, and the seasons as well, following seasons. Um, it was really an eye opener for me. Um, otherwise business, I have some business mentors that helped me as well to understand critical thinking how to um, challenge my assumptions, to be better, um, be open-minded, to test things out, uh, to, to vet everything, and plan for, plan for hurdles as well. Most people enter business and they say, uh, I have this goal, I want to achieve this or X, but they don't plan on the hurdles and what can happen. So I think really more analytical thinking has been an important piece, and that was from a very important casino mentor I've had. Um, you know, I'm as someone outside of restaurants, you know, one of the common things I always hear is like, oh, the food and beverage space, the restaurant space is a difficult one to get in. Um, you're, you're an expert. Why it, it, is that statement true? And why is that? Is it hard to get it? I'm sorry. What so when that? people think about like, I want to open up a restaurant or I want to get into the, you know, the, the restaurant business or I want to start kind of an effort there entrepreneurial wise. A lot of the common feedback I always hear is that's a tough business. That's a really tough business. We kind of hit on that, but in a nutshell, is that true and why? Kyle, it's the toughest business in the world. It, absolutely. And I'm not, I, I didn't, I, I'm not the first one to say it. I, I really think it is. There's so many different things. Typically when you start off and you have the drive to open a restaurant, it's your, your, a, you want to have a restaurant, whether you're a chef or you're into food uh, or you're into wine, 
and you you love you work in a restaurant you have this experience making people happy it's really ingrained in us it's part of what we do and you just you're really good at cooking and that's but you have to understand not just cooking business leases real estate everything legal permits applications tax implications all those things um marketing there's a lot of hats to wear it's it's easy for restaurants to it, it's expensive and that it's you can quickly lose money and and so there's a lot to understand and learn so i would my advice is to work for great restaurants learn how to operate them if you can work as a chef work in the front of the house work in all positions so you understand what the dynamics are what makes a restaurant go and work with the owners come in on your own time if you have to and learn different aspects of the business accounting marketing public relations social media whatever it takes be well versed in everything because you'll have to do it all or at least have an understanding of it whatever it takes um Luke, once again, thank you for spending time. I have a few more questions here for you. On that note of mentors, I've asked this question, and I'm curious to know who would your answer would be. But who's probably had the greatest influence? Once again, it might be hard to name just one, but if you want to name a couple. The greatest influence on your career and life who you've never met? Yeah, so I would say there's so many there's so many chefs. So you can... Um, uh, Valtero Marchese is a, is a famous chef. I never met him. He passed away a few years ago. Um, different business people that I read books. I like to read books about business and mindset. I would say that it's really, and most of these people, just be a mentor. Many, you don't have to have a relationship directly with, a, with someone to be, for them to be your mentor and you be their mentee. It could be people, like you said, you don't know. It could be live, people are living, people that are even, that are dead. They don't have to be alive. But what I say is if you if, the, if someone's alive and you want to meet them and be and ask them to be your mentor, you can't really it's hard to walk up to a stranger that's really successful and say, hey, we be my mentor. They'll say, why? <laughs> exactly. and why? Why shouldn't they? So if you would like to pursue that, I would say and you can't just go give them your business card. Hi, I'm so and so. And I, I really like your work. That's flattering. Uh, but. I would say provide value to them, work for free, ask them what you can do for them, figure out something you can do and, and get into their life, but make sure you're providing value. And for the mentors you, you don't know who are living or dead, read their books, their biographies, study their history. Under, there's, there's always plenty of information to mine about people. What was their mindset? What did they go through? What were the struggles? Most of the successful people I've ever seen or read about had tremendous failures, cataclysmic failures. And they didn't make it. It's not just their highlight reel you're looking at. There's been struggles. They've all struggled. So that should that gives me a lot of confidence. I've had plenty of my own. And you know you can get beyond it if you're smart and you have grit and you're intelligent and ask plenty of questions. Luke, I love that you hit on that because through this platform, Next Level Casino Careers, we've hosted panels. And one of the most common questions we get is on this subject, mentors. And one of the most common questions is, how do I find a mentor? I don't have any mentors. And I think you hit on two key, key important points there. One, through your story, right? You went door to door. You were willing to work for free. That's providing value, right? So you're going to have a better opportunity at finding a mentor if you're providing that value, which you touched on. Hey, I'll work for free. I just, you know, I just want some of your time to learn from you. I think that's an important point. And the other one is, you know, sometimes with today's age, you don't need to have, you can have mentors who you can listen to via podcast, via video, via the, you know, I know LukePaladino.com, um, you've got resources there. So there's plenty of ways to kind of absorb information that maybe you only just had a book, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, there is. So there's plenty of things. There's books and biographies to read. Again, like you said, podcasts or or there's anyone that's successful is either a guest on the podcast or hosting a podcast, or they have interesting guests in, in whatever industry you're in. So I would encourage you to read that. And that's where I, I listen to many podcasts and I'm always growing and learning. And just because of this chapter of my life doesn't mean I, I stop because everything's changing and iteration, iterating. And our business is very fluid. Either you're going backwards or you're going forwards. It's not static. And I would say that for any industry or business. 
Uh, Luke, uh, fill in the blank here. All great chefs have blank in common. I would say they have a, a, an innate sense of food and their senses. So whether it, it's about, it's, it's about, it's a visceral, um, I mean, it's visceral, it's tactile, it's, it's utilizing your senses and understanding the food, what to do, how to process it, how to cook it, what to add at the certain time. We don't always, you don't always measure everything. And that develops over time is your sense of your food sensibility. Got it. Um, your food zone. Who respects food. Um, so if, if this is probably easier for you than most, but if, if I had to say, you know, Luke, I'm having people over for dinner. I don't want to bend over backwards with all these ingredients. So if, if you were going to make a meal, you're going to have you're gonna buy someone to make a meal that you know people are going to love, five ingredients or less, what would you recommend to a friend as far as what's a great meal, simple, but always delivers that connection and a great food experience? Well, I'd say key is if you're not, I would planning and that I always plan when I have people, guests over because I've done big elaborate dinners and I'm always so busy cooking while they're there and I like to socialize them. So plan to socialize, plan ahead, prep ahead. And I would base things. I, I would take ingredients. I would take whatever your protein is, your roast or whole roasted fish. I like to do larger format, like a porchetta or a lamb leg roast uh, or, or a piece of beef rib, uh, again, like a whole fish and then do accompaniments and vegetables that are simple to go with it. Make sure that it's, it's things you can put in the oven and take care of that are very simple and then lay out all at once to take care of. And I, and I love the idea of just very few ingredients as well. Don't try to overdo it. And if you have any appetizers, lay those out beforehand. Got it. Um, I'm going to go the other way with it. Is there a meal that is really hard to get right that a lot of people make, right? I don't know. I don't know what that is, right? I don't know if that's steak or veal or some kind of pasta dish. But is there something that comes to surface as you think of a lot of times people get this this meal wrong? Well, I would say this is that chefs, we're not so we do it all the time. We cook consistently. So typically we have our our margin of success is much higher than most. But we yeah. still we don't cook things many times. We'll, we'll start a new dish on the on a menu and it goes through three or four iterations, just like a famous artist. Like Matisse didn't make his masterpieces without sketching and smaller versions until his, you know, his gorgeous, enormous paintings, his masterpieces. So I would say and anything you do takes practice and you just practice a dish over and over and over again. I really can't say any dish is more or, or le is, is harder to do. Yeah, there's different skill levels to do certain things. Pasta is a good example where People can make ravioli and getting it thin enough is probably the biggest flaw. One of the most common things and mistakes I see, I can even see it on Instagram where people, <laughs> the pasta is too thick at the edges or around it and the texture is not right. So there's many different things. So I would just encourage everyone to have fun, enjoy the process. Don't take it too seriously. It's food and don't give up on a recipe. Make it over and over again. Make it your own and enjoy the process. Yeah, I love that. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate. I think through the pandemic, we've all cooked a little more. And I could say that firsthand, like, but I'm not, I'm not a good cook. I don't claim to be, but I could say I've gotten better through those reps that you talked about and enjoying the process. And it's actually something I look forward to on Sundays. So, um, you. it's Luke favorite quote, and maybe there's not one single favorite quote, but is there a quote that you like? Hmm. Yes. How you do anything is how you do everything. And I look at that. I, that's my mantra in business and in my life is, is whatever you aspire to be or what you want to do, it's, it's, it starts with your decisions. And that's how you decide to do things, how you decide to speak, be, hold yourself. And in the process of you're, you're creating your life, you're co with, with every moment. And in every decision you make, so how you do anything is how you do everything. So I start with high standards in whatever I do so that I'm consistent. And that gets me to, to my goals. So on, that personal, professional. Thread, on that same thread, Luke, is there a personal 
Uh, this is a question I like to ask. Is there a morning habit or an evening habit or just a habit in general that, that you have found has had a tremendous impact on your life that you would recommend to others? Yeah, I would say over the years I've been, I wake up and uh, I follow a pretty healthy lifestyle, I'd say. So I, even though I'm a chef, I'm careful what I eat and consume. I, I wake up, first thing I do is I meditate for at least 20 or 30 minutes a day. And that clears my mind. It makes space. It puts me in touch with myself. And I feel open and more, more um, I feel more gratitude for the things I do have, grateful. That's really a great mindset. That's a, that's a great way to start my day. And then I move my body somehow. I work out. I do something, swim, do yoga, lift weights, kettlebells. And from there, I start my day and I just make sure that as I go through my day, I remain conscious throughout and aware of how I am, how I feel, how I engage with people. Am I, am I constantly improving myself? Am I always up-leveling myself throughout the day to reach my goals and to be who I, I want to be? Look, that's interesting. So the, the meditation kind of practice is a common one. I would say half of the guests we've had, or at least close to half have mentioned that. Was that something that you adapted for, you know, maybe you mentioned it, um, but, but when did you adapt that and kind of why? So I've, I've done meditation. I started probably 15 years ago, but really more seriously, I would say in the last five years, I have never skipped a day, not one time. And I believe for me, I, I just sit up in bed when I wake up and I do it. I don't, there's no excuses. Yeah, I, I call it punching the clock. And if I want to get something accomplished, just punch the clock, do it. It's work. I enjoy it. If you want to go work out, if you'd like to go to the gym and get in better shape, punch the clock, go to the gym, get it done and finish. I, I look at meditation as the same way. And for me, it creates space. It clears my mind. It stops. I'm so for the biggest thing I would say is that your minds are just processing thoughts and emotions all day long. And when you sit with them, you realize that, that they're, they're, you're not them, if that makes sense. And throughout the day, you, you respond less reactively to things and you think more clearly over and over again. It's very powerful. And I found it to be very helpful. And I enjoy the process and I look forward to it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And one of the misconceptions, I think, is a lot of times people say, I want my mind to turn off. So that's why I can't meditate. And it's actually the opposite, right? It's by observing those thoughts, they lose their power and you're not yanked around as much throughout the yeah, day. Exactly. And I think that's a, that's a great point to bring up is that we'll never turn off our thoughts. It's not whack-a-mole. You can't just pound your thoughts away as they, as they come up. As they arise, just notice them and look at them and say, oh, where did that come from? And just be curious and let them go. Yeah. Just like passing clouds, let them go. And then throughout your life, so when things come up or negative emotions throughout your day, they don't they don't affect you. They don't affect me nearly as much. And I feel so much more um, happy and peaceful, and clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Noting is a powerful exercise. Um, you know, I, I think this has been awesome, Luke. I just once again just appreciate you taking some time. Uh, two final questions here. Um, you traveled all over the world. Favorite food city in the world that maybe not a lot of people might think of, right? So a lot of people think of New York, LA, you know, I'm sure there's places in Italy, but is there kind of like a sneaky under the radar city that has, has great food in your opinion? Well, I would say, so Italy, there's, there's plenty in Italy and I can go there. Um, uh, I, love, I think Venetian food in Venice is, um, it's a tough thing about Venice, it's a very touristed city. So people usually when they go, if they're not equipped and they don't know the, the few restaurants that are really great, don't experience Venice in its, its, in its true uh, brilliance. Um, it's a food, the fish is from the Adriatic. There's, you can't get these varieties anywhere else. So that's why it's very special. They follow the seasons. That's one. I think I was very impressed too when I went to uh, Madrid. Madrid is one of the greatest food cities in the world, I'm convinced. There's so much beauty and passion and products and, and so many young chefs. I was in Paris recently as well. Paris is a great food city and I'm not eating at the, I don't eat it typically. People think that chefs want to eat at Michelin fancy restaurants. I, I typically don't. I've done it. 
Um, I don't find a lot of satisfaction in that personally. I like food that's more connected to um, tradition and 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 uh, that is different. You, you know that story behind it. And Paris, there's many young chefs with great ideas. Uh, I had some tremendous meals there as well. And some great picks there, Madrid, Venice, Paris. Um, Luke, this is the final question I ask everybody on this show, um, which is three keys or three things people can implement today to help them start take their career to the next level. So what would those three things be for you? Work hard, be curious about everything and provide value wherever you go, whoever you work with, whoever you work for, provide value. I love it. Work hard, be curious, provide value. Well, there you have it, Luke. Once again, just thank you for taking the time, you know, your knowledge, your insight. I, I think you provided a lot of value here today. Thank you, Kyle. Always great to see you. Appreciate it. Great Thanks for having you. me on the show. Awesome. Have a good day. Take care. Check out more episodes on nextlevelcasinocareers.com.